Well, good morning to you. If you have your Bibles with you, we will be in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. We'll look at verses 18 through 25. Matthew's Gospel, verses 18 through 25. Hey, that was a great uh, version of Carol of the Bells. It was jamming. Uh, I know your soul was cleansed by that. Uh, Hey, we have got a neighbor that like every once in a while when it gets too loud over here, will call and leave a message and tell us to turn it down. There's probably one on the answering machine right now waiting for me when I, when I leave church today. Um, but man, Merry Christmas to y'all. Let us pray. God, we thank you that we could come to church on the day that we recognize as Christmas. Celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you chose to be Emmanuel. God with us. And God, we thank you that you are with us in this room today. Lord Jesus, we worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. We pray this and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. The Reverend James Allen Francis many years ago wrote a poem and it was published in 1926 and it was given this title, One Solitary Life. This is what James Allen Francis wrote in that poem. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompanies greatness. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of of the human race, and the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. And all God's people said, 
Amen. It is not very often when me, as the pastor of a church, literally gets to stand before you on a Sunday morning and tell you, Merry Christmas. I will also say that it is very hard to focus on preaching this morning because your routine is so out of whack. I mean, my precious wife got up and cooked us an awesome breakfast of bacon and sausage and eggs and biscuits and bacon and pancakes and man, how about you? You all might be a little bit out of focus this morning. Some of you have traveled here to Reedsville to visit family. Some of you are hosting family that you have got to cook for and clean up after and look after. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, God will come and help us worship today. Even though we're a little bit off kilter, a little out of focus, God is good. My friends, there is... No other person who has influenced and changed and transformed the world as we know it as the man, Jesus. His name is awesome. His name is wonderful. His name is to be worshipped. And that name is Jesus. And it is him who we are here to worship this morning. My friends, when we celebrate Christmas, we are celebrating the truth that Jesus was God's greatest gift of grace to us. God, at the very heart of his being, is a God of grace. God is a God of grace. And because God is a God of grace, It is deep within his heart to bless us with his good gifts. So let me give you this morning a definition of grace. And then I want us to look at three different biblical ways that we understand God's dimension of grace. Here is the definition of grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God of God. Grace is something that God gives to us that we don't deserve. Grace is something that God gives to us that we haven't earned. The only way that you qualify for God's grace is by not qualifying for God's grace. Grace cannot be earned Grace is never deserved. It is only freely received as a gift. So let me illustrate grace this morning. And and let's have a little fun with this idea of grace this morning. Who can I grace today? Who can? (laughs) Hmm. It's a nice, crisp. $20 $20 bill. Merry Christmas. God bless you. It's a gift of grace. That's grace, isn't it? What did she do to earn it? Nothing. What did she do to deserve it? Nothing. Hey, if you're a first time visitor here, we don't do that every week. I'd be broke, y'all. We run two services. So let me give you three dimensions of God's grace. Three ways that God blesses us with his grace. Number one, one of the ways that God blesses us is something that is called common grace. Common grace are the free gifts that God freely bestows upon everyone. It's the air we breathe. It's the food we eat. It's the water we drink. It's the clothes we wear. It's the homes that we live in. It's the money that we have. All the free blessings 
that each and every person receives from the good hand of God is a gift of his grace. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45, he, God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's common grace. God freely gives his graces to everyone. And it has nothing to do with us being good or bad, righteous or unrighteous. James 1, 16 and 17 says this. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That's common grace. Every good gift you have, every good thing that you experience in life is a gift of God's good grace. And there's so many, isn't there? As you simply look back upon the year 2022, how has God blessed and graced your life? So on this Christmas day, and on every day, we should offer praise and thanksgiving to God for His common grace. And all of the good blessings that He freely bestows upon us. Number two, there's a second kind of grace that is found in the Bible, and some people call it sanctifying grace, and other people call it sustaining grace. This is the grace that God gives to us to sustain us through hardship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us that he was given a thorn in the flesh, that the Apostle Paul had a hardship in his life. And the Apostle Paul says that he prayed three times that the Lord would take away this thorn in the flesh. But God said to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, God told Paul, that he was not going to remove the hardship from his life, but that only he would provide the grace to endure it. I don't know what weight any one of you in this room might be carrying this morning, but I want to let you know that God knows. Is it something at your job? Is it something in your marriage? A sickness? Taking care of an aging parent? An addiction you're fighting? Is it something financial? God knows the weight you are carrying. And God's grace is sufficient for you to endure it. I wish I could tell you that your life will one day be perfect. But unfortunately, there is no end to the grief and hardship you will face in this life. But I also want to say, that there is no end to the grace that God will show us and provide us. Finally, number three is what is called saving grace. Matthew 1, 21 tells us this. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That name Jesus means God saves. That name Jesus can also mean Yahweh saves. God is a God of salvation. 
That's what Jesus came to do, to be the Savior of the world. The baby who was born into a manger grew up to be the man who would be flogged and crucified and died and buried and raised from the dead for your salvation and for your forgiveness. He defeated sin. He conquered the grave. Jesus restored our ability to once again live in relationship with God. Humanity, you, me, we needed a Savior and God provided it in His Son, Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, His resurrection brings us salvation and forgiveness and life and hope and victory and over death and all of it, all of it is a free gift of God's grace. There's the story of a Catholic priest who when he was a young man committed a horrible, horrible sin. And he just felt like he could never atone for it. So he decided that he was going to go into the priesthood to prove to God that he was sorry and remorseful and repentant. Well, this priest had heard of a nun who was known for hearing the voice of God and, and receiving these prophetic revelations from the Lord. So he decided to go and pay her a visit. And so the priest asked her, if you can really hear the voice of God, I want you to ask him two things. Number one, what sin did I commit? And number two, has it been forgiven? So this nun retreated to her secret place of prayer. And after a few days of being in communication with God, she came from her secret place and she called for the priest to come and meet with her. So the priest asked her, well, what did God say? What sin did I commit? And she said to him, God spoke to me and he wanted me to tell you he can't remember. Here is how you spell Christianity. G-R-A-C-E. Grace. What makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world is grace. Your forgiveness your salvation is about what Jesus did on the cross for you. Listen, church. Grace is not about trying harder. Christianity is not about, God, I'm going to make up to you what it is that I have done wrong. When Jesus was dying on the cross... He did not say to the crowds of people, now go out and try harder. Now go out and make up for the sins that you've done. That's not what Jesus said. As he hung on the cross, he spoke three words, it is finished. You see, here's Satan's deception. You see, Satan wants to put in front of you your sin. Do you know why? Because he wants to shame you and guilt you and condemn you and get you to think that it's up to you to make up for your sins. My friends, I will tell you from personal experience, that is exhausting and frustrating. You do not base your salvation on you. It is simply received as a free gift, as the grace of God. This morning, as we prepare to come to the table of grace, the Lord's Supper, 
How about you? How about you? Are you still living in the bondage of sin that Christ came to set you free from? Don't go another Christmas missing out on the greatest gift you can ever receive. And that is the gift of Jesus. The Bible tells us That if we simply believe in our heart that Jesus was God, that Jesus came to earth, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, made atonement for you, and that he was raised from the dead three days later, if you believe in that, you can be saved. And it's all simply a free gift. Of God's grace. That all we have to do. Is receive it. If you. Are here today. And you are already a believer in Christ Jesus. I want this table to remind you. That your sins have been forgiven. By Christ. If you are living in shame and guilt and condemnation over something you have done in the past, I am here to tell you that the grace of God is a stronger force in your life than your sin. But guess what? Satan doesn't want you to believe that. Satan doesn't want you to experience that. Satan doesn't want that to be the reality of your life. If you are a sinner who needs the grace and forgiveness of Jesus, then you are worthy to come to the table this morning. As we come to the table today, here's how it'll work. Just come on down. You can grab your cracker, your juice, head on back to your seat, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. As I stand before you this morning, I want to let you know that I am a sinner who needs the grace of Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful today as I come to this table of grace That Jesus was born into our world. That Jesus died on the cross for me and for you. And I'm so thankful today that because of Jesus Christ and because of his free gift, that he has given to me a worthless worm of a sinner like me, the hope of eternal life. So as you come to to, to, to the table today, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Remember, Jesus is a gift of God's grace. And you can receive his salvation. You can have his forgiveness. So come to the table today and grab the elements of communion.